Hi everyone, thanks for joining us for this webinar on questionnaire assistance centers and libraries. As you know, Asian Americans Advancing Justice is working to ensure a full and accurate count of our communities in the 2020 census. As a national hub, we're working to develop curriculum and materials to support your get out the count work, including fact sheets, toolkits, webinars, social media graphics, translated materials, and more. Today, we're excited to dive deeper into how to provide questionnaire assistance, do's and don'ts, and the important role of public libraries in getting out the count for the 2020 census. As you know, this webinar is the 15th installment of our monthly census webinar series, which we launched in August 2018. If you missed our previous webinars and want to tune in, you can access them with the links on this slide or go to www.countusin2020.org. Our next webinar will actually be taking place next week on Wednesday, March 4th at the same time, and it will be focused on census mailing operations and self-response. We are joined by two great colleagues in our Get Out the Count work today. Anne Lay is the 2020 Census Statewide Network Manager with the Voting Rights and Census Program at Asian Americans Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus in San Francisco. She had the privilege to work as a legal organizer for the Koreatown Immigrant Workers Alliance, a research analyst for SEIU United Service Workers West and United Healthcare Workers West, and a project director of community engagement at Asian Americans Advancing Justice Los Angeles and received her BA in political science from UCLA and her JD from Loyola Law School of Los Angeles. We're also joined by Dr. Anna Ndumu. Dr. Ndumu is the assistant professor at the University of Maryland College of Information Studies and is a champion of social justice. She comes to the college with over 13 years of academic library and college instruction experience. Seeking to understand the cross between social identity and information behavior, her research examines the ways in which cultural perceptions are shaped, often erroneously, by available information, but can be transformed through better information access. Dr. Ndumi specializes in the intersection of Black identity, libraries, demography, and social inclusion. Her recent work explores the information worlds of African, Afro-Caribbean, and Afro-Latinx immigrants living in the U.S. Dr. Ndumi received her PhD in information at the Florida State University School of Information. After our two speakers present, we will have Q&A at the end of the webinar, and you can either use the chat box or the questions box to send your questions, or you can raise your hand to have your line unmuted, and you can ask the question yourself. If you have questions during the presentation, please also use the chat box or questions box to send us your questions, and I will repeat these instructions at the end of the webinar when we get to Q&A. This webinar is recorded, and we will send out the recording as well as a copy of the presentation to everyone after the webinar. Before we begin, I wanted to highlight our census website at countusin2020.org. Check out our website for all of our webinars, all of the recordings, and the accompanying summary blogs. The website also hosts our toolkit, get out the count fact sheets, partner resources, and more. Just this month, we updated our community engagement and communications toolkit and all 12 get out the count fact sheets in English with new information from the Census Bureau, updates on Census Bureau operations, and updates from our campaign. You can find all of those resources again at countusin2020.org. Um, there are also new customizable templates available for all 12 Get Out the Count fact sheets in English. So these are templates that you can take, add your logo to, add local information to, and personalize. And all of our translated materials for those Get Out the Count fact sheets in 15 Asian languages are also in the process of being updated. So we'll let everyone know when those new translations are posted. I also want to share that our census hotline is live. So you can call our census hotline at 844-2020-API or 844-2020-274 for support in English and other languages. And without further ado, I will turn it over to our first speaker, Anne. Thanks so much, Bessie. Um, and uh, thank you for all of the work that you're doing to coordinate these webinars. I'm excited to be joining Professor Ndumu uh, for this webinar. I um, just as an aside, I think librarians are cool. So I'm really excited to be sharing this uh, this moment with her. For my segment of this presentation, uh, so um, for the next slide, uh, I'm going to go over the questionnaire and the different ways to complete it, um, some do's and don'ts on how to provide assistance, and finish off with some frequently asked questions and how to respond to them. So in the next slide, you'll see 
that this is what the paper form will look like. Apologies that it's, it's very small, but here are the first four questions on the paper form. People will need to respond to how many people live in a house, anyone that wasn't included in that calculation, whether the home is owned or rented, and your telephone number. The Census Bureau may use this to contact you with this number if they have any follow-up questions for you. And then on the next slide, you'll see um, the rest of the questions for the first person. So the questionnaire will also ask for each person's name, sex, age, and date of birth, and racial identification. There is a question to check off Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin, and the last question allows you to check off your race and also write in specific ethnicities that are not available as checkboxes. Please keep in mind some things. So unfortunately, the sex question is only binary, and if you leave this blank, the Census Bureau will actually impute your response. So please check off the box that you most closely identify with. Another thing to keep in mind is for the race under question number nine, unlike for the sex question, question number nine allows you to check off multiple boxes. So if you're mixed race or you have multiple ethnic backgrounds, you can have all of those backgrounds reflected in your response to this question. As an example, if you're ethnic Chinese, but culturally Vietnamese, Khmer, Filipino, Thai, Burmese, etc., you can actually check off multiple boxes to um, better reflect your ethnic and cultural background. In the next slide, I um, have a, basically a, a run through of the Census Bureau operations timeline. Um, this is the self response uh, section. Um, and uh, obviously, there will be more details on this in a future webinar. But you can see here that the Census Bureau's operations are divided. So this is the self response period, which runs from March 12th to um, uh, April 30th. Um, and um, so when uh, so this will begin actually with the first mailing that will hit um, between March 12th and March 20th when households will begin to receive the unique ID code that they will use to complete the form online. There will be four subsequent attempts for reminders and follow-ups, and the fourth reminder will include the paper questionnaire, which will only be available in English and Spanish. This will be sent out between April 8th and April 16th. The last reminder will be set out between April 20th and April 27th, after which time the non-response follow-up period will begin. And starting May 13th, Census Bureau enumerators will be deployed to homes that do not respond to the census. Um, but please keep in mind that despite this timeline, if you respond, self-respond after um, the self-response period is over, um, you can still, um, you can, you're still able to do that. So in the next slide, you'll see the different ways to self-respond. There are three ways. The online version will be translated into 12 languages, five of which will be Asian languages, including simplified Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Tagalog, and Vietnamese. Uh, again, paper forms will only be available in English and Spanish. And then for online, um, it will be very similar. So the online version will be very similar to the um, the phone version. Um, so for um, by phone, the language support will be limited to uh, translation into 12 languages, including the five Asian languages. So that will actually include Mandarin and Cantonese, Japanese, Korean, Tagalog, and Vietnamese. The next slide will go through what's called non-ID response. So non-ID response means that you don't have your unique ID code for whatever reasons. So households can still respond um, online or by phone, even if they do not have their unique ID code. You'd use this non-ID response if you didn't receive your census materials in the mail or in person, or if you lost or misplaced your form, or if your household responded but left you off the form. This can easily happen if there are multiple families living at that same address. Just a note that you cannot request a paper form if that's your preferred method to respond. So you'll just have to wait until the fourth re reminder to receive that in the mail. And I will re-emphasize that the paper form will only be available in English and Spanish. However, language assistance guides will be available in 59 different languages, and those can be used as um, similar to cheat sheets to help limited English proficient community members with completing their forms. Unfortunately, the Census Bureau did not translate those into any Pacific Islander languages. So as a result of our partnership with empowering Pacific Islander communities, those gaps have been covered. 
The next slide will just show you the basic um, information about the Census Bureau uh, operations timeline for non-response follow-up, which is called NERFU for short. And this is the phase that will run from May 13th until the census is over on July 31st. Households that respond after April 30th will be removed from the NARFU caseload in real time, which means that it's unlikely that an enumerator will visit that household during NARFU. But please note that households can continue to self-respond through July 31st. So the next slide, uh, the next couple of slides will actually show you um, the many resources that have been developed to reach hard-to-count communities. The, advances, uh, the Advancing Justice Affiliation has produced resources in 15 Asian languages and eight Pacific Islander languages, and they can be found at countusin2020.org. In the next slide, um, it, uh, you'll see um, that our brothers and sisters in the Latinx and Arab communities have also produced materials that you can access. You can find those at um, the Spanish speaking ones at agasecontar.org. Um, and for the Arabic language resources, you can find those at yalacountmein.org. So, the next couple of slides, I'm going to go through some general guidance. So, the first slide is going to be around general guidance for outreach. Um, I know this isn't necessarily a presentation on outreach, but I do think it's helpful to include these in here. So for the dues, we do want to make it clear that you do not work for the Census Bureau. You do want to highlight the benefits of census participation. You do want to address questions and concerns people have about responding to the census. You do want to tell people how and when they can respond to the census. You do want to point people to the language assistance guides if needed. And you do want to encourage people to respond in March and April, but clarify that they can also respond through the end of July. What you don't want to do is guess the answer to a question if you're not sure of the answer. So uh, for the next slide, I'm going to go through some general guidance for providing questionnaire assistance. So some of these may be duplicative, but I do think it's important to emphasize these points. So again, we do want to make it clear that you're not a Census Bureau employee. We want to encourage people to respond on their own. We want to highlight phone options and language assistance guides. We want to provide assistance if it is necessary for someone to be able to complete the census. We want to help people enter the response only if they cannot do so on their own. And we do recognize that this is uh, going to be a big challenge um, because uh, of the limited number of languages that the census forms will be translated into in both the, um, the online format and the paper format. Uh, we do want to explain that once the Census Bureau receives your response, it is completely confidential. I do not work for the Census Bureau, but I also want to keep your, I will also keep your response private. You do want to ask the respondent each question and help them enter the response they have given question by question. And we also want to respect the confidentiality of respondents. So we do not want to share with other staff or volunteers. And while you're providing assistance, uh, we will, we should keep our voices low um, to ensure that uh, responses will, will stay quiet or private. The next slide will go through um, a number of don'ts when you're providing general assistance or uh, questionnaire assistance. So you don't want to use your own knowledge or beliefs about the respondent to fill out the form for them. This is a form that they should be filling out themselves. We don't want to gather information from, from a respondent to enter it later on to, later into the form. So this should your your assistance should be happening in real time. We don't want to collect or re retain response information outside of the questionnaire. That's not the purpose of why you're, you're um, providing assistance for them. And so we want, I, again, we want, to be, we want to be providing assistance in real time. We, we don't want to tell people what to enter, enter into the questionnaire. They should make their own decision about their response. And we don't want to guess the answer to a question from a community member if you are not sure of the answer. So now I'm going to go through some frequently asked questions. You probably know many of these things already, and many of the other FEQs that I'm not including are things that I already covered earlier in my presentation. But here are the ones that I think you should be prepared for. So the, if the question comes up, I'm undocumented or here on a visa, should I be counted? Yes, because as long as you are living most of the time at a residence in the US, you should be counted at that residence. So people who should be counted include non-citizens, 
foreign students who are here in the U.S. on student visas and other foreign citizens who reside in the U.S. on census day April 1st. But those that are here on vacation or on a business trip should not be counted. Next question is, who should I include on the form? How about my child or my parent who lives with me part time? The answer to that is that you should include everyone living at your address when you respond to the census. So this includes roommates, tenants, and family members, basically anyone who lives and sleeps at that address most of the time. But if you can't determine where they live most of the time, they should be counted where they are staying as of census day, April 1st. So this includes children who are in a shared custody situation or other arrangements, um, or uh, who are living at more than, um, who, who are living at more than one uh, residence. Uh, the next slide includes um, uh, the question of, uh, if I'm not sure if my landlord, roommate, or family responded, what should I do? So if you're unsure whether or not someone responded at your residence, um, then you should submit a response on your own and include everyone living at your address. The Census Bureau actually has processes in place to resolve duplicate responses. Similarly, if the question comes up, if I forgot to include someone, can I add them later? So if you've made a mistake on your online form, you cannot reopen it to make changes. To fix your mistake, you should submit a new, complete, and accurate form. And again, don't worry about submitting duplicates because the Census Bureau will resolve these duplicate responses um, for a specific address. Uh, if I don't have my, a permanent address, how can I be counted? So you can respond online and enter in an address, intersection, or public place where you sleep most of the time. If there is no place where you sleep most of the time, then you can enter the location where you will be on April 1st, 2020. Finally, the last uh, set of frequently asked questions is, how is my response used? So your response, your census response can only be used to create general information about the population, like how many people live in your city and statistics about age, gender, and race. The Census Bureau cannot share information about you as an individual, and the Census Bureau cannot share your personal information with any other government agencies or with the public. Uh, similarly, the, the question about confidentiality will oftentimes come up. So how do I know that my, my answer will be confidential? By law, the Census Bureau cannot release any identifiable information about individuals, households, or businesses, even to immigration or law enforcement agencies. The law also states that the information collected may only be used for statistical purposes. All Census Bureau staff are bound for life to protect your personal information, and if they violate this, they will face a penalty of up to $250,000 and or up to five years in prison. So the penalties are pretty harsh, and it um, acts as a very solid deterrent to prevent your answers from um, getting revealed. The final frequently asked question is, I heard that Department of Homeland Security shares information with the Census Bureau. Will DHS see my census information? No, this is the one way, um, this is the one way exchange. So the Census Bureau collects information from other government agencies, but the Census Bureau cannot share anything in return. So even Department of Homeland Security and other parts of the government are not allowed to see your responses to the census. These are common FAQs that we think you'll encounter when providing assistance, but it is by no means comprehensive. We, can, we have been compiling lists of questions and we can share them if you're interested. So please contact me after the, the webinar. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for that very informative presentation. And everyone on the webinar, as a reminder, we'll be sending out these slides to you after the webinar as well as the recording. Um, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to our next speaker, Dr. Anna Ndimu. Hi, everyone. I'm honored to be joining you today. Um, thank you so much for the invitation, Bessie, and, and I, too, am honored to be sharing this platform with you. Um, today, I'll be talking a little bit about how we are training and um, providing professional development to librarians all across the country. There are over 10,000 uh, public libraries across the country, and there are also academic or university libraries school libraries, law libraries, and special or private libraries. And there's often a misconception that the census and census outreach specifically is uh, a burden that only public libraries should share. And that is a misconception that we're trying to disrupt or dismantle uh, because this iteration of the census is very unique. And so uh, we need all hands on deck, if you will. And this will require uh, the help and assistance of school media center librarians, um, 
even librarians in prison populations. Uh, so this is a massive effort. As we know, this is the first digital iteration of the census. And so um, it's vastly different than 2010. Without further ado, I'd like to show a video with uh, a colleague. Um, she is a director of public libraries in Santa Monica, California. And her name is Cecilia. And this video was created through the American Library Association. Libraries are dependent on federal funding, and this is why the 2020 census is so important. I'm a librarian. I oversee the four branches in Santa Monica, and I'm a division manager. Libraries are more than books. They offer safe spaces. They offer technology. They offer services in any type of literacy, financial literacy, health literacy, digital literacy. We're just going to meet you where you are. The 2020 says it's important because it's a way to understand who we are. It has so much um, information about your area, your city, your state. Everyone should respond to the census. College students, seniors, people experiencing homelessness, you still need to be counted. We can use those numbers to show the need of the library. In today's world, the community trusts libraries because we are lighthouses. We provide light. I want to make sure libraries are available for everyone. Thank you so much. So it's really easy to underestimate how much librarians know about the census. And that was one of the first things that we wanted to do. Sorry about that, Anna. It went on to the next video. One second. There we go. Thank you. No, no problem at all. So one of the first things we wanted to do on a national basis is to train librarians to think about the census. And so um, one of the misconceptions is that librarians are uh, people who have a wealth of information, so they know everything about everything. And so um, we didn't want to assume, so we've been really just demonstrating the value of the census and what um, the census really represents. And it is about social inclusion, right? Um, so we know that everyone counts and the census is uh, mandated by the Constitution. And everyone um, is supposed to be counted on April 1st, every 10 years. This is important for representation. Um, it's also important for governance and democracy and also for disseminating resources, um, especially to vulnerable communities. And this means close to $8,000 per person across 10 years annually. And so we definitely want to amplify this because immigrant communities especially benefit from how the data from the census is used. It's about redistricting and it is also about your personal efficacy. Um, and we want to definitely broadcast that, as my colleague Angie said, your data is confidential. That's one of the biggest concerns, privacy, confidentiality, anonymity. So we've been training librarians that is really difficult to disaggregate census information um, because this is that is usually used at the block or the track level. So this is some of the basic foundational uh, teaching material that we've been using and it's provided through census. And in the next slide, you'll see that we have also been focusing um, particularly on hard to count communities. And what's interesting about immigrant communities is that they fall into the for bucket, if you will, of uh, hard to count communities. So the census defines um, HC groups as those who are hard to locate, hard to contact, hard to interview, and hard to persuade. So again, what's unique about immigrant communities is that they fall into each of these categories. Um, and so 
in that herd. Um, and also they may be living in access controlled properties um, and they may be in anti-government communities, short-term renters, especially migrants and minorities. They may be living in dense urban areas or informal sediment housing. They may be even uh, transient communities who work in rural agricultural sort of migrant farm communities. Um, or homeless living in disaster prone areas or institutions um, such as uh, immigration detention centers. They may be again nomadic or transitory. There may definitely be age, language and disability limitations. And we have especially been paying attention to those with limited connectivity. So what have we been doing? We have been providing staff training, We've been training librarians to design effective programming and accommodations. Um, we've been providing special cultural programs and also partnering with organizations like Asian American Justice Center. Um, in the next slide, you'll see that we've also been using maps to kind of provide an idea of where these uh, HTC communities are with a special focus on communities of color as well as immigrant communities. And at the bottom of this map, you'll see that there is um, a feature to show the radius to libraries. So we've been um, especially concerned with making sure that every highly uh, concentrated HTC area has at least one library in a five mile radius. So that's been very important. In the next slide, um, you'll see some of the materials that we've been able to create. And my colleague Gavin Baker at the American Library Association has done a great job of providing digital tools that librarians can easily use, and also some of the guides that are important to um, answering and distilling questions. For example, how much can we help? And as Anne mentioned earlier, there's a lot of concern about how do we help communities actually fill out the form? Are there legal implications? Um, is there a boundary that we're crossing? Uh, and so these important uh, toolkits are available online and they help librarians know what and what they should and shouldn't do. In the next slide, you'll see some of the key dates. We're also very strategic in our efforts. So we've really been following the Census Bureau's um, sort of guide and their approach. So as uh, the answer and response um, opportunities change, our approach nationally is changing. So our programming, our um, outreach material, <clears throat> excuse me, and some of our print uh, marketing material is changing according to the different benchmarks. And Anne did a yeoman's job of explaining these earlier, so I won't go into them. In the next slide, you'll see some of the resources that we have been uh, creating to provide uh, training. And you're welcome to use these and peruse these as well, especially if you have a standalone census response center or have a mobile outreach center. Some of our best practices we have been able to glean from immigrant community organizers. Um, and we've also been hoping that they would use our guide as well because we, if anything, librarians have a lot of information about data organization, privacy, um, ethical implications, and so on and so forth. So you're free to connect with us at one of our upcoming conferences or webinars that are listed at the bottom, or to use one of our resources. In the next slide, you'll also see an example of 
one of the libraries that is really hyped and pumped and excited about the census, not only are they um, providing so much air uh, broadcasting time to come in and use the library, they've um, also are distributing bookmarks throughout their community. Um, they're getting out of the library facility and into communities, which is sometimes a challenge of libraries to uh, really promote um, and provide awareness about what the census is. There is a lot of mistrust and also apathy um, considering the socio-political climate. And this is one of the challenges with engaging immigrant communities. We know that the census has been weaponized and it, there's a strategic effort to really ice out immigrant communities. But not only is Broward County Libraries providing um, extra training and visibility around the uh, census, but they're also encouraging our own communities of color to work for the census. How better to have buy-in than to have representation um, among census enumerators and tabulators? Um, so that's another way that libraries are helping. In the next slide, you'll see um, a forum, and I should say communities, not community, blah, 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 whatever that says, but we hosted a forum and I was delighted that Bessie and Rayma from AAJC were able to come and represent the Asian diaspora. Um, and this is where librarians and uh, immigrant community organizers work together um, through design thinking to think of creative new ways to provide outreach to immigrant communities. Um, and so this was called the Counted In Forum. And um, we spent a day just playing and thinking. And trust me, this is not something that librarians do often. So it was a very fun time. And out of this, we created the Counted In Toolkit, which you'll see in the next slide. And this toolkit really is to aggregate every single thing. We kept hearing that uh, librarians were overwhelmed and didn't know how to really um, reach out to immigrant communities. So we, again, we aggregated the information I shared earlier from ALA, the American Library Association, and also information from the Census Bureau. We created ready to use downloadable and customizable marketing materials, um, just like AAJC. And we amplified and boosted some of our partners resources so that librarians don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, a lot of agencies have provided uh, so much material and then resources and translation and ready to use, ready to go packages for different diasporic groups. And I apologize, I am joining you guys today from a public area. Um, so sorry for the background noise, but um, also, we are providing census efforts by state. And so in the next slide, you'll see the material that we came up with. And so librarians across the country receive this and they are posting it not only in their libraries, but also at bus stops, laundromats, places of worship, um, and in schools. And we really wanna get the message out that libraries are here to be intermediaries and that if you do not have digital access, you're free to come and use a library space. If you just have questions about the safety or privacy of the census, we're here to help. In the next slide, you'll also see that there are other materials that you can use to connect with whatever diaspora group is in your community. And again, we don't always have to create these material. We can use what um, our allies um, or our coalition partners have already created. The census has loads and loads of full page and half um, page uh, marketing tools. And also you can, again, connect with some of the thought leaders or advocacy leaders who um, have already done this work. And some of them have been doing this work for years. So these are some of the resources that I wanted to share today. And again, our priorities are hard to count communities, those who are digitally divided and communities of color, including and beyond immigrant groups. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Anna. Now we'll open it up to questions. So if you have a question, you can either use the chat box or the questions box and type your question, or you can raise your hand and go to webinar and have your line unmuted so you can ask your question. Um, so we'll pause for a few seconds so people can get their questions in. And as a reminder, this presentation and the webinar recording will be circulated to everyone. Uh, thank you. Bessie, this is Anne. I actually wanted to make it very explicit. I know that it was in one of the slides that I had presented around how to self-respond, but I did want to point out that the Census Bureau, um, the mobile questionnaire, the Census Bureau will have a, a program called uh, mobile, mobile Questionnaire Assistance. And so basically those would be um, uh, operations uh, where Census Bureau staff will actually go to a particular location where there's a high uh, level of foot traffic for hard to count populations um, to, to provide provide uh, assistance on the spot on uh, to fill out their forms. So community organizations can actually now begin scheduling with Census Bureau partnership specialists to arrange for um, placement of mobile questionnaire assistance. The operations um, won't start until late March, but we can certainly start to make those, uh, those schedulings now. And thank you. And we have a question from Jessica, and this is a question for Anna. What signage tools are available for library collection sites to guide in visitors so they know who they can talk with and where to go? Hi, yeah, that's a great question. Um, in addition to some of the ones that I used, uh, the website, the ALA, American Library Association census site, they had an exclusive um, media designer and graphic designer who created all sorts of uh, materials. So they're uh, posted on that website as well. And it really just says, you know, some of the basic, I'm sure you've seen some of those read posters that are kind of ubiquitous now with celebrities. Um, they're kind of just like that. We, we try throughout the library community to keep our signage very simple um and it's it really minimal and so it just says census question mark ask us here right and you may think that that may be too basic but sometimes those little nuggets and those little messages um really invite people to come with whatever question they have and we don't want to lead people with our signage and our promotional material we just want them to ask, ask away, and no question is dumb, and no question is silly. Um, so all of those materials are really on ala.org slash census. And immigrant specific material, you can find that at counted, counted in libraries.org. Um, one last thing I wanted to say is we have action kits where we have, um, stickers that say I counted, I participated in the census because my family is counted and so on and so forth. Um, and it also has posters, it also has blank posters, uh, we have bookmarks and so we have about 20 left. If you would like one of those, please email countedinproject at gmail.com and we'll be happy to mail it to you free of charge. And if you have any other questions, do let me know. Thank you. And we have a question for you as follow up to what you had shared about MQAs. Um, who do we contact to schedule on site census assistance? Yes, yeah, so um, you can work with your Census Bureau partnership specialists. Um, who are um, basically the Census Bureau staff that are helping to facilitate uh, outreach uh, efforts in your area. And I do see that there was a, a comment about um, some agencies reporting having trouble reaching the Chicago Regional Office to find their partnership specialist. So I am actually not familiar with other or better ways to, uh, to find those partnership specialists, but I do know that if you are in the Chicago area, then um, our advancing just Asian Americans Advancing Justice Chicago affiliate um, it has been heavily work, also been working very very heavily on the census and so you can um, tr uh, reach them and I'm, I think they would be able to help direct you to um, to the appropriate people. 
Thank you. And those questions are from Lisa and Lindsay. So Lindsay, we will follow up with you offline to connect you to our affiliate in Chicago who might be able to help. And one closing question for both Anne and Anna, with the Census Bureau mailings going out so soon, um, for folks who are not currently working on the census but want to get involved, what is an immediate action item they can take? I'll um, jump in here and just say the biggest takeaway today would probably be is, you know, if you have an idea or if you um, represent um, a particular immigrant community group or community of color um, and you just have a desire to um, uh, really broaden your reach, please connect with your librarian. Oftentimes there are outreach specialists or um, community experts within libraries who are dying to connect and what they find is that Immigrant communities are often exclusive and hard to really connect with. Um, sometimes it's understandable. Uh, immigrant communities do not want to be tokenized or um, their public trust is just low across the board, across many institutions, libraries included. And so um, don't hesitate to connect with your local librarian, um, even if it's just to use the space. Um, and if you need extra, I suppose, information about how to um, really navigate the census. Again, it's a very complicated iteration of the census, right? And there are so many ways to respond. Um, now, identity is uh, really vast within the census. Um, so race is, is not conflated with ethnicity anymore and you have Middle Eastern, North African and on and on and on. So if you need information, um, use our resources on alacensus.org um, and also connect with your local librarian. So that's the takeaway today. Come and use our facilities and resources. Thank you. So um, the work, uh, this is Anne, so the work that I'm doing is primarily based in California, um, but we've, uh, we've uh, there's actually a pretty robust uh, efforts going on uh, statewide uh, to get the count out. Um, so I would recommend that you access the resources that have been developed in language through the countusin2020.org website, where you can actually find a lot of different fact sheets and um, uh, all sorts of information in 15 different languages. And I think that the best way to start is just by educating the folks around you. So um, if you are, um, if you go to, uh, um, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, hometown family associate, hometown association, or um, you know, you um, are a member of a religious institution, or you have a book club. It can just start as basic as that, um, because trusted messengers are the people that you know tend to um, that are folks that other other people will listen to, and you can help to play that role or help to educate the, the trusted messengers in your community so that they understand the importance of the census and they can help to drive other people to participate. Thank you, and we'll that we don't have any further questions so we'll end the webinar um, on this slide you can find contact information for our speakers as well as contact information for our team in DC and on this next slide is a list of our upcoming webinars so our next webinar will be taking place next Wednesday March 4th at the same time and we'll be focusing on census mailing operations and self-response Thank you to everyone for joining us today and you will receive a copy of the presentation and recording um, shortly and thank you to Anne and Anna for joining us and sharing their knowledge. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.